Hello everyone and welcome to Crash Course Medicine. Today we're going to be talking about cerebral palsy which is in this paediatric specialist area of the website. So to begin with we're going to be looking at what you already know. So question one, is cerebral palsy genetic? A yes, B no, C certain types can be. Think about what causes cerebral palsy. The answer is B, no. It is caused by an injury to the brain while it's still developing. So this can either happen in the womb during pregnancy or it can happen during or shortly after birth. Question two, what can be a symptom of cerebral palsy? A, the baby doesn't roll over in either direction. B, the baby cannot bring their hands together. C, the baby has difficulty bringing their hands to their mouth. Or D, all of the above. The answer is, D, all of the above. You get mainly motor symptoms with cerebral palsy, so all of these answers could be seen in a baby with that disorder. Question three. What is the most common type of cerebral palsy? Is it A, mixed, B, ataxic, C, spastic, or D, athetoid? The answer is C, spastic. So today we're going to be asking what is cerebral palsy? We're going to be looking at the causes and the pathophysiology. We're going to be then looking at the types of cerebral palsy and the symptoms and history that those types may have. The investigations and differential diagnosis, the clinical examination and OSCE tips, and then finally treatment before we go back over the questions we just did to see whether you've learned anything today. So what is cerebral palsy? Cerebral palsy is an umbrella term for a non-progressive injury to the brain which originates during the antenatal, perinatal or early postnatal period which can affect development and movement and posture. Cerebral palsy is often also accompanied by disturbances in sensation, cognition, communication, perception, behaviour, epilepsy and secondary MSK problems. This can all depend on the severity of the injury. One in 400 babies born in the UK have a type of cerebral palsy. Injury to the brain may be due to any of the following things. Interrupted or limited oxygen supply to the brain. A bleed within the baby's brain. A premature or difficult birth. The mother becoming infected during pregnancy. Or it can be idiopathic. So what can cause cerebral palsy? Now let's move on to the causes of cerebral palsy. So the causes can be divided into antenatal, perinatal and postnatal factors. As you can see from this table, there are various different causes for each category. Antenatal causes can be prematurity and low birth weight, multiple births, maternal illnesses and infections, and also pregnancy complications. Antenatal causes are are the leading causes of cerebral palsy with 70 to 80% of patients falling into this category. Perinatal causes next. This can be due to birth asphyxia or complicated labour and delivery. This category has around 10% of patients falling into it. Postnatal causes can be non-accidental injury, head trauma, meningitis or encephalitis and cardiopulmonary arrest. Around 25% of babies who survive neonatal seizures have cerebral palsy afterwards. So around 70-80% to 80 of the cases are thought to be due to antenatal causes and of the above the primary risk factors are prematurity, multiple births and maternal infections. Protective factors are good obstetrical care, magnesium sulfate, antibiotics and corticosteroids. The pathophysiology can vary greatly depending on the etiology. With ischemia and hypoxia, the white matter of the neonatal brain is supplied by the adjacent cerebral arteries. Although collateral blood flow from the two arterial sources protects the area when one artery is blocked, this area is susceptible to damage from cerebral hypoperfusion. Autoregulation of cerebral blood flow usually protects the fetal brain from hypoperfusion. However, it is limited in preterm infants due to immature vasoregularity mechanisms and underdevelopment of arteriolar smooth muscles. 
Infection and inflammation. This process involves microglial, brain macrophage cells, activation and cytokine release, which causes damage to a specific cell type in the developing brain called the oligodendrocyte. The oligodendrocytes are a type of supportive brain cell that wraps around neurons to form the myelin sheath, which is essential for white matter development. Intrauterine infections activate the fetal immune system, which produces cytokines. Cytokines are toxic to premyelinating oligodendrocytes. Premyelinating oligodendrocytes have immature defences and so cause dam cause this causes damage to the myelin sheath. Excitotoxicity is a process where increased extracellular glutamate levels stimulate oligodendrocytes to increase calcium influx, which stimulates reactive oxidative species release. Glutamate is increased because hypoxia causes white matter cells to reduce reuptake of glutamate due to lack of energy to operate glutamate pumps. Glutamate is also released from microglial cells during the inflammatory response. Here you can see a good flow chart which talks about some of the main causes of these factors. Moving on now to the types of cerebral palsy. You can see that it is split into four main types, spastic, athetoid, ataxic and mixed. Spastic itself can be split into four types, monoplegia, hemiplegia, diplegia and quadriplegia. Monoplegia means one single limb is affected. Hemiplegia is ipsilateral two limbs. Diplegia is either both of the lower or upper limbs. And quadriplegia is all of the limbs and the trunk. Athetoid can be split into dystonia, rigidity, dyskinesia, chorea, and athetosis. Dystonia is a slow rotating movement of torso or limbs. Rigidity is limited movement. Dyskinesia is general involuntary movements. Chorea is sudden spasms in fingers and toes. And athetosis are slow movements of the finger or face. You can also have ataxic and mixed types. So cerebral palsy is classified according to the motor impairment, anatomical distribution and functional level. Symptoms may be delays in reaching developmental milestones, seeming too stiff or too floppy as a baby, weak arms or legs, fidgety jerky or clumsy movements, random uncontrolled movements, walking on tiptoes. You may find that the patient also exhibits some of these symptoms. Feeding, drooling or swallowing difficulties, constipation, problems speaking or communicating, seizures, gourd, scoliosis, urinary incontinence and learning disabilities. So let's take a look at example case history for a patient that may have cerebral palsy. An 18 month old child with a history of prematurity presents with failure to meet developmental milestones. The child sat independently at one year, has few words vocally, does not pull to stand and exhibits increased deep tendon reflexes in the lower extremities and sustained clonus at both ankles. There is good upper extremity function. Here's another example of a case history. A two-year-old boy, born after a normal pregnancy and delivery, presents with an asymmetric gait. Examination reveals mild spasticity of the left upper and lower extremity, hyperactive left knee and ankle deep tendon reflexes and decreased dorsiflexion of the left ankle compared with the right. When walking, the patient walks on his left toes and his left arm is held mildly flexed at the elbow with the palm facing the floor. Would you be able to pick up on the key notes in these histories? What classification of cerebral palsy would you diagnose these two patients with? So moving on to investigations. As you can see from these brain scans, image one shows the brain of a healthy child. Image two shows the brain of a child with cerebral palsy. As you can see, the ventricles are enlarged and there is diminished volume of white matter. The MRI is abnormal in up to 80% of cases of cerebral palsy. So what would your differential diagnosis be? Spinal muscular atrophy. You would be able to do DNA testing for most of these subtypes to differentiate. 
muscular dystrophy. Muscular dystrophy is progressive and there will be a loss of function and muscle weakness after three years of age. You can also do a muscle biopsy which will reveal degeneration of cells. Familial primary dystonia, they will have a family history of this and genetic testing is available. Myelod dysplasia, this is usually non-spastic and it's associated with a lack of sensation below a specific spinal segment. So what will we see on clinical examination? If the patient has an upper motor neuron lesion, you will see increased spasticity, increased tone, hyperactive deep reflexes, clonus, Babinski sign and little to no muscle, muscle atrophy. However, if they have a lower motor neuron lesion, you can see flaccid paralysis, decreased or absent deep tendon reflexes, fasciculations and fibrillations and severe muscle atrophy from disuse. First of all, assess the general appearance of the patient. Ask the child or adult to walk or run if appropriate and observe their gait. Comment on the ability to take an object. Feel the tone of the upper and lower limbs. Examine the power in reflexes. Assess the primitive reflexes such as grasp, plantar reflexes, stepping, rooting reflex and coordination. And also note any involuntary movements. Plot their height and weight and assess their developmental milestones. So what treatments available for people with cerebral palsy? They can have physiotherapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy and also some medication. Diazepam or baclofen for muscle stiffness, Botox injections to relax muscle groups, melatonin for sleeping difficulties, anti-seizure medication, laxatives and painkillers. So, let's go back through the questions from the beginning and see if we've learnt anything. Question 1. Is cerebral palsy genetic? A. Yes. B. No. C. Certain types can be. The answer is no. It's caused by an injury to the brain while it's still developing, either in the womb, during or after birth. Question 2. What can be a symptom of cerebral palsy? A. The baby doesn't roll over in either direction. B. The baby cannot bring the hands together. C. The baby has difficulty bringing the hands to their mouth. Or D. All of the above. The answer is D. All of the above. Question 3. What is the most common type of cerebral palsy? Is it A. Mixed, B. Ataxic, C. Spastic, or D. Athetoid? The answer is C. Spastic. Thank you for listening. You've reached the end of the slideshow now. I hope you found it interesting and have found it useful for your learning. Please join us again on Crash Course Medicine for some more material.